words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be ever acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Let me start by repeating the opening of the third chapter of John's first epistle. See what love the Father has given us. That by itself is a pretty good sermon. So I'm tempted to just sit down and let us all meditate on it for a few minutes, to let it sink in, to let us feel it in our bones. See what love the Father has given us. But, as some of you may suspect, my mind is a messy, cluttered place. And as I read and reread today's lessons, things various and diffuse arose there. Epistemology, teenage angst, Socrates, and the 60s soul singer Sam Cooke, the Dalai Lama and the butterfly effect, and Thomas Merton, as well as an anonymous 14th century monk. I think maybe they're all connected. Maybe they're all about one thing. So bear with me as I wade into them for a few moments. Let's look at the lectionary first. It seems to me that if there's a unifying thread wo woven through these readings, it's colored with knowing and not knowing. Listen to Peter talking in Acts. And now, my friends, I know that you acted in ignorance. And our psalmist, know that the Lord does wonders for the faithful. And St. John in the epistle, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. And St. Luke in the gospel, then he opened their minds to understand. The difference between understanding and confusion, the lessons are telling us, between knowing and not knowing, is the difference between faith and disbelief. But how do we know anything? This is the business of epistemology, the branch of philosophy that explores knowledge. If that sounds a bit esoteric, it really isn't. Don't we weigh sources of knowledge and their validity every day? In matters of our own health, for example, wouldn't my doctor told me have a different kind of weight than I read it on the internet. But it's tricky, isn't it? There are many levels of knowing, many paths to knowledge. When I was about 17, for instance, before I ever heard the word epistemology, I, caught myself, I found myself caught between two ways of knowing. At that point in my life, I was a pretty smart guy at least in terms of book learning, and being 17, in my mind I had convinced myself that I knew everything worth knowing, and my job in school was just to coast towards the moment when my brilliance would be widely recognized. <laughs> At the same time, though, there was another little knowledge voice somewhere deep inside my heart that kept whispering, Ed, you don't know much. <laughs> Mind knowing versus heart knowing. But being 17, I managed to synthesize these two seemingly contradictory bits of knowledge. I think only a 17-year-old could manage that. I knew everything, and I knew that I didn't know much, therefore, there wasn't much to know. <laughs> the world must be, or so I thought then, a simple kind of bleak place. 
I lived with this depressing synthesis for a short while, but then, as sometimes happens, a third kind of knowledge appeared. Not long after my 18th birthday, I met a girl and fell in love. Perhaps something like this has happened to you, too. Luckily for me, that young woman had a thing for know-it-all pseudo-philosophers. She still does. After meeting her, I didn't think about epistemology for a long, long time. Although it did occur to me then that the soul singer Sam Cooke had hit just the right note on the whole knowing, not knowing problem. Remember him? I'm sure some of you do. Who could forget his song, Wonderful World? <clears throat> Don't know much about history, don't know much biology, don't know much about a science book, don't know much about the French I took, but I know that one in one is two. And if this one could be with you, what a wonderful world it would be. One in one did make two and the world was wonderful. Fast forward 20 years to 1990. After a series of unpredicted events, too many to recount today, I found myself tasked with teaching philosophy and theology in a very small New England boarding school. Epistemology reared its head again. How do we know anything? And more specifically, how do we know God? For teaching purposes, I started asking those questions seriously then, and I've been asking them ever since. Luckily, I've had some good instructors to help. The first of them was Socrates, who pointed me towards humility. You may recall that when the oracle at Delphi was asked who was the wisest person in the world, the answer came back out of the smoke that it was Socrates of Athens. When Socrates was asked about this, he said that the only wisdom he had was that he knew that he didn't know anything. For him, what was important were the questions. In my classes, we formulated it this way. If you think you know, you don't know. But if you know that you don't know, then you know. <laughs> I found myself humming my own lyrics. I don't know much philosophy. I don't know much theology. But I know that if you look, the answer's better than a book. What a wonderful world this is. Other important teachers were the weatherman and mathematician Edward Lorenz with his work on the butterfly effect. The notion that tiny actions in one place, like a butterfly moving its wings, can have enormous consequences later on. Then there was the English scientist James Lovelock with his Gaia hypothesis. The notion that the Earth itself is a living organism. And most especially the Dalai Lama with his declaration of interdependence, which asked us to give up the illusion that we can live independently. In their own ways, each of them pointed out that everything is connected to everything else. To fully know even one small thing, we would have to know everything, which is not possible for humankind, even 17-year-olds. Again, Humility is in order. If you think you know, you don't know. So how then can we know God? It sounds absurd, but unknowing may be the path to knowing God. Or so wrote the anonymous 14th century author of the contemplative classic, The Cloud of Unknowing. If you know you don't know, then you know. God 
the mystic writes, cannot be grasped or held by thought. God exists beyond all human ideas or conceptions. God, in human terms, can be self-contradictory. God may be a creator, but God is a destroyer as well. God may be a rock, as I said at the outset of this homily, but God is a soft breeze and a lapping wave as well. God may be a judge, but if so, God is the judge whose property is always to have mercy, as we used to say in right one days. None of these concepts can adequately describe our God. So how to know God? By setting aside all concepts and categories and by opening ourselves to direct encounters with the divine. Thomas Merton, the great 20th century Christian thinker, wrote of a space in the human heart that is, as he put it, in constant and inescapable contact with God. There dwells the voice that in one moment can say, Ed, you don't know much. And in the next can say, let me show you everything that matters. Once, standing in that space, I looked into a young woman's soft brown eyes and found God there. Today, I can stand in that same heart space and look into those same eyes, now possessed by a much older woman, and God is still there. This morning, I held in my arms a girl who is not quite two yet. Her warm hair snuggled up across my cheek, and God was there. All of us have these opportunities to encounter God if we move beyond our concepts and fears and judgments to then look for God with the eyes of the heart. Around us is this wonderful universe this one beautiful corpus of being with its quarks and muons, with its trout lilies in the forest and its day lilies edging our lawns, with its tigers and viruses, with its galaxies and supernovas, all being, being itself. It's okay to call all this God. It's okay to call this God's love. It's okay to love it all. We are embedded in being. It is holy. We are holy. See what love the Lord has given us. And isn't this what Jesus came to tell us? His voice as soft as a song. Can you hear it? But I do know that I love you, and I know that if you love me too, what a wonderful world it would be. Your preacher could say amen right there. It is a wonderful world. But there's an exhortation to add. Jesus does not call us simply to listen to the song. Jesus calls us to be the song, to wrap its notes around ourselves like a robe, each of us a brightly colored butterfly, so that the world might see God's presence through us and hear it and say, see what love God has given us. May it be so today and every day. Amen.